Okay, good. We want to get started with the class today, or I want to get started with the class today, by asking you all a question. This is a passage that you probably know or have seen. Uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Let me read this, and then I have a question for you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. My question is, what does this mean? Especially, what does it mean for us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? Mary? Uh, letting God use us as we will, not as we want. Okay. And considering that our bodies are the temple, his temple now, right. we should treat it with respect. Okay. You know, for, for him to use us as he wishes and to respect the fact that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Bill? Well, along with that, Paul also said, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Exactly. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies and right. your spirit. Good. You're Which bought with a price. Michael? We are his and we're not our own. Okay. We belong to him. Same thing. We're bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Chris? I was considered it like service, like actually giving your body, your time, your, your effort, and your service to the Lord as well. Okay. So that we spend our, the energies and the time and the efforts that we have available to us, we spend them for the things of God. Keenan? I think that's a good point because um, most of us view something that's sacrificed as dead. And right. so we're talking about sacrificing. You know, it, sometimes it would be a lot easier just to go to heaven and be with the Lord instead of right. sacrificing, bringing ourselves into control. Okay. Saying, I'm going to spend this time focused on the Lord. I'm going to spend right. this time fasting or whatever. Right. Um, so our, our sacrifice is subject to being brought under control of the Lord. Right, exactly. And I think that's why he says living sacrifice, so that somebody doesn't make the mistake of thinking the thing I ought to do is kill myself. You know? <laughs> and Paul, who wrote this, also said, you know, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, and it's hard for me to decide, is it better that I go and meet with the Lord now or stay in the world? And so, yeah. Um, Becky? Um, just that, that when you, when you want to enlighten the who God really is, that there is a change and renewal of your thinking. Right. And that you should um, be open to God's teaching, God's will, and everything in your mind. Right, exactly. I think the renewing of the mind. The reason I ask that question is because for many Christians, without consciously thinking about it or saying this, I believe many Christians think that, okay, God gets my soul, and I'll focus my mind on him sometimes, but my body is pretty much mine. Okay? Uh, in terms of, when we, and we're talking about fasting today, in other words, disciplines. We, we have talked about prayer and Bible study in the previous lectures, and while doing them is not common, people really don't, we don't have prayer lives that we ought to have, we don't have Bible study we ought to have, and that's why we're talking about them, why we're learning about them. There's still a sense in which everybody accepts that, yes, as a Christian, I should have a prayer life, I should have Bible, I should study the Bible, those things are common. But now, the phrase I use all the time from the South is, you leave preaching and go to meddling, in terms of now we're talking about maybe there is something you ought to be doing with your body in order to be renewed and to be transformed and to pursue holiness, to use the, the phrase that uh, Whitney uses in his book. That perhaps there really is some, how we handle our bodies, what we do with our bodies, may really, really make a difference in terms of our service to God, in terms of that being part of our sacrifice. Because it does say to offer your bodies. Not, it doesn't say offer your minds. It doesn't say offer your spirits. Now, it does say by the transforming of your mind. But I think there's a reason why Paul said offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And it's something that most of us Protestant Christians... Don't think about it. And if we think about it, we probably don't like it. And so that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about the first of the disciplines, which most people would find hard, and one of the disciplines that some people find every possible excuse for not thinking they ought to do. And that is fasting. Um, it's interesting when I say that a lot of Christians believe they'll do anything to keep from fasting, and I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, Richard Foster in his book, if you if you read up uh, on that, he comments on the fact that between when he was preparing to write 
celebration of the discipline in, in the 1970s, he started looking for books on the different faith, uh, different disciplines of uh, the Christian faith. And he was unable to find anything that was written about Christian fasting, spiritual, the discipline of fasting in the Christian faith, between uh, 1861 and 1954, almost 100 years, he could find nothing that had been written about this. And yet, fasting as a spiritual discipline of the Christian faith has been around for the whole history of the church. I'm going to talk about some biblical examples of things in a minute. Part of, I think, the problem we need to recognize is that fasting has gotten a negative rep, and there are several reasons for that. You know, a negative reputation, a bad, a bad rep. Um, one is, in the Middle Ages, the, the church, which was at that point the Catholic Church, went through periods of great spiritual dryness because they started thinking that what you did, what your, your works, and this is why the Reformation happened, this is why Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the, the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral, is because the church had gotten to the place where they started thinking that if I do these things, then that will save me, that will make me right before God, and I'll be, you know, I'll be guaranteed my salvation. Some of those involve the ascetic disciplines, particularly fasting to an extreme point, um, and self-mortification, flagellation, um, things of that sort. And, and we see some of that kind of thing even today. I mean, people who will walk for mi go for miles and miles and miles on their knees mm -hmm. to the Virgin de Guadalupe shrine, thinking that that kind of mortification is somehow pleasing to God. Well, it's not. Sorry. It's, it is, it's a matter that um, the ascetic practices got out of hand because they failed to realize no practice of discipline is valid unless it is done as part of recognition of God and worship of God and a desire to be more like God. Just doing it for the sake of doing it is not helpful to you. Okay, Marvin, did you? They had an even better way to sell of indulgences. So oh, yeah. They haven't even go through that. <laughs> exactly. You know, you get... You, you, uh, you can buy grace. Uh, um, so, but that, so one reason is the Middle Ages emphasized the ascetic practices so much at the expanse or or without the regard to the spiritual side, to becoming more holy. It was a matter of if I do these things, then God will think I'm okay. Um, another reason that it's it's been common to not like fasting and some of the other uh, silence and some of the others. Some people today associate those with Eastern religions, you know, because there's Eastern asceticism. Asceticism means self-denial. An ascetic is a person who denies himself, sometimes to the extreme. So some people associate that with Eastern uh, philosophy. But the biggest reason I believe that fasting and some of the other disciplines have gone, fallen out of favor is because our culture, let's face it, has become so thoroughly self-indulgent that anything that smacks of not satisfying every appetite that I happen to have is perceived as not being good. We've convinced ourselves that um, there's something inherently positive in satisfying whatever appetite I happen to have. We talk about uh, retail therapy, yeah. okay. <laughs> shopping, because I want stuff, and, and gluttony is a problem. Okay, I'm standing right here, you can see me, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing here. But because of that, because of this idea that our culture believes that satisfying every appetite that might happen to come up is somehow inherently good, fasting has become, for the most part, obsolete. And has only made a recovery, in terms of Christian circles, probably in the last 20 or 30 years. Partly because of Richard Foster's book. You know, this was the first book in the 1970s that really started saying, hey, we need to recover the disciplines that God the Holy Spirit had taught believers over the last 2,000 years as ways in which they can become more holy, that they can pursue holiness. And Foster deserves every credit in the world for that, and then others have come along since then. But this idea in our culture that whatever appetite we have, we should satisfy it, because, you know, you might get sick if you don't, you know, eat three huge meals a day. When in fact, all of the research says that that's absolutely contrary to the fact. Diabetes and cholesterol problems and high blood pressure and on and on and on and on and on. Even cancer, perhaps, have been linked to the way we eat, the way, the way we indulge ourselves. G.K. Chesterton, one of my heroes, said very, very wisely, as he always says things wisely, not all desires are desirable. 
And that includes our desire to eat as much as possible, as often as possible. In fact, there has been, through the last 2,000 years, a very clear sense in which fasting, that is denying yourself, especially food, but denying yourself something which, and I'll give you a definition for fasting. Fasting means to voluntarily deny yourself something that otherwise is good. I mean, it's not, you're not denying it because it's something evil. Food is, you know, is, I believe God gives us food to sustain us, but also for pleasure. God wants us to enjoy uh, the things he's given us. So fasting is to voluntarily deny ourselves something that is otherwise good as a discipline that can draw us closer to God. So what we're going to do this morning, uh, this afternoon, it's always morning somewhere, uh, this afternoon is to talk first about what fasting is, what the biblical model is for it, and why we should do it, and then we're going to talk some about how we should do it. Um, John Wesley says that some have exalted fasting beyond all scripture and reason, others have utterly disregarded it. You know who John Wesley is, he founded Methodism, a uh, great spiritual leader. Well, the fact is, and we need to start out with this, just to be clear, nowhere in Scripture are Christians commanded to fast. Jesus did not tell us we had to fast. There are other things he did tell us we had to do. Fasting is not one of them. It is not a requirement or a demand <coughs> on Christians, but Scripture, including the New Testament, is very clear that fasting is something, while not required, is, can be good and profitable and beneficial. And again, for 2,000 years, those who have practiced spiritual fasting have said, this is one of the most powerful ways for us to open ourselves to God. Right? Um, Richard Foster, in, from Celebration of Discipline, says, Numerous people have written on the many other values of fasting, such as increased effectiveness in intercessory prayer, guidance and decisions, increased concentration, deliverance for those in bondage, physical well-being, revelations, and so on. In this, as in all matters, we can expect God to reward those who diligently seek Him. Fasting, very simply, is to set aside something that we might desire in order to make room for God. Greater room for God in our lives. Fasting and prayer are almost always linked together. If you will, fasting is sort of an amplifier for prayer. It is a, a magnifier of our spiritual lives. Now, fasting is not just about food. You can fast from anything. That's why the definition doesn't say not to eat. It's to voluntarily deny yourself something that's otherwise good for the sake of growing in holiness. You can fast from shopping. <laughs> or from television. Or from computer. Or from Walmart. Or from Walmart. Okay, I mean, we don't want to mix political reasons with, you know, with uh, whatever. But anything that you otherwise might do, especially if you feel that it is something that is occupying too much of your attention, if it's something that is uh, becoming a focus in your life, that in itself does not draw you closer to God, then setting that aside for spiritual purposes can be a very positive thing. Now, fasting, and here I'm talking mostly about, uh, about food fasting again, is not intended to punish the flesh. This is not self-mortification. It's not to try to, pump, to do something to hurt yourself as though I'm a bad person and I need, to, I need to mortify my flesh in order for God to like me. It instead is a simplified way of redirecting our attention to God by taking something else out of the equation that may be causing us not to focus on God. If we take our eyes off of some of the things in the world, whether that be a preoccupation with food or shopping or TV or whatever it is, if we take our eyes off the things of the world, the simple fact is we then have a greater likelihood of uh, focusing our attention successfully on Jesus. It's as simple as that. Fasting is not a way to get God to do the things we want Him to do. Fasting changes, doesn't change God, changes us. It puts us in a new place. And I believe when Romans says, you know, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, I believe this is one of the ways that we can do it. Now, um, <coughs> fasting was common in biblical times. You'll notice that um, the passage in Mark, and I've juggled my papers again. Okay, here we go. Uh, from Mark, this is a case where Jesus was accused of not fasting when 
not only the Pharisees, but John's disciples, the followers of John the Baptist did. Mark 2, and this occurs elsewhere as well. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? In the Matthew version of this, it's actually John's disciples that come and ask this question. And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. And in Matthew, it goes on to say, but when the bridegroom is no longer with them, they then will fast. <coughs> My point in this is that fasting was very common in biblical times. The Pharisees, as righteous Jews, did it. John's disciples did it, and on and on. In fact, um, in the Bible, we have specific examples of the following people fasting. Moses, Elijah, King David, King Jehoshaphat, the prophet Joel, the people of Nineveh, after um, Jonah preached to them, and they, they came to recognize that they were, they were sinners before God. The prophet Daniel, uh, Esther, and the Jews of Persia, we're going to look at those, some of these passages later. The prophetess Anna in the temple when uh, Mary and Joseph went to present Jesus, she lived in the temple and she uh, prayed and fasted to the Lord. We have Jesus himself, of course, fasted in the desert. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he was still Saul, it was after his experience in Damascus, he went for three days, had neither food nor water, as he tried to figure out, you know, what this meant that he had seen Jesus, whom he had been persecuting, uh, persecuting his followers. The church in Antioch fasted and prayed before they, they anointed Saul and Barnabas for their first missionary trip. Paul and Barnabas um, prayed as they, and fasted as they prepared to appoint elders in churches. And then, down through the history of the church, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, and on and on and on and on. All have dedicated themselves to a regular discipline of fasting, especially from food, but from other things too, in order to make themselves more open to the things of God. Um, again, Jesus fasted. He went into the desert, and it says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he, Jesus, was hungry. You can look at the rest of that passage, and there's a lesson in that for us uh, a little bit later. The early church, I mentioned um, in Antioch, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, now this is instruction from the Holy Spirit, set aside for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Moses, um, there, we'll talk about different kinds of fasts in a few minutes, but Moses actually fasted for 40 days and 40 nights twice, back to back. Uh, we don't really know if he had anything in between, but what happened is he went up on the mountain to receive the law from God, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He received the tablets of the law, came down the mountain, and when he saw what the Israelites were doing in terms of worshiping the golden calf, he broke the tablets and then went into another 40 days of fast, as a, a sign of mourning and repentance on, on behalf of the Israelites. Now, those, I'm not recommending back-to-back 40-day -back fasts for you. Um, <laughs> but there, there are supernatural things. Now, there are people today who fast for 40 days. That's not impossible. But it requires a very special kind of anointing. We'll talk about that as we go along. But the point is that so many people down through Scripture and in the history of the church have fasted, and the testimony is pretty much universal for anyone who's taken it seriously. I mean, some people say, okay, I'm going to fast. They don't prepare themselves spiritually. They don't prepare themselves physically. They spend a miserable, you know, six hours. Um, <laughs> and, then the, and then they go, this is crazy. You know, I'm, I'm going to go get a burger. Well, there are wrong ways to do this. Those who have taken it seriously and have understood it to be primarily a, a spiritual exercise more than a physical exercise, the purpose of the physical side is only to support the spiritual side. Those people have pretty much universally testified that fasting, especially from food, is a way to open ourselves up to a, a, a more intense a relationship with God, to grow closer to Christ, to be more uh, spiritually attuned to the things of God. So, fasting was an, an expected discipline in both the Old and New Testament. That's why it just it occurred. Nobody ever felt the need to explain it. In fact, Jesus, while there's no commandment where Jesus says, you should fast, there are at least two cases where Jesus said, when you fast, do it like this. Now, what does that assume? What, what's, what's behind that, when you fast? The assumption that you're going to do it. 
And so, in giving instructions in that, there, there simply was a sense in which that is something that those who are spiritual people who are seeking to be closer to God are going to do. Um, so let's look at some other quotes here. Dallas Willard. Um, Dallas Willard talks quite a bit, and, and he's got a couple of books that relate to this. One of them is called The Spirit uh, of the Disciplines, which is an excellent book. Um, really recommend it to you. In fact, I'm almost sorry we didn't use that as one of our texts for this. Willard has got a very down-to-earth, very sensible, but very godly kind of approach to this. And one of the things that he identifies is, and I quote him here from The Spirit of the Disciplines, we are, when we fast, he's talking about, we are discovering that life is so much more than meat. Go on in. We're not offended, you know. Um, Willard goes on, our belly is not our God as it is for others. Rather, it is his joyful servant and ours. Now, he says, our belly, we Christians, our belly is not our God as it is for others. Philippians 3, I'm going to read you 19 to 21. This is what Paul wrote to the Philippian church, talking about unbelievers. He said, their, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control control issue, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The real issue for us when we consider our whole Christian life, but especially as we talk about spiritual disciplines, is who or what is really in charge of our lives? Is it our stomachs? Because according to Paul, that's a sign of those, those who are unrighteous, who are not followers of Christ, that their stomachs is their God. So we need to say, are we so driven by our appetites for all sorts of things, including our appetite for food, that that's going to control us? Fasting as a spiritual discipline will tell us what it is that has control of our lives. One of the things I experience when I fast is I, um, my tendency to be short-tempered with people and um, to and pride. One of the things that happens, I believe, when we fast is that whatever it, whatever it is that is controlling our lives or whatever spiritual problems we have tend to be accentuated in a way that we can identify them and pray about them. I had that happen, a trip I was taking, where I was in an airport, everybody was in my way! Okay? Move over! Don't stand in the middle talking! And, and I'm going, Ross, <laughs> What's wrong with you? This is sin. This is pride. This is, I'm more important than these people. Get out of my way. <laughs> I believe the clarity that I had in that was because I was fasting and stuff. And so, if it is, if, if you have, if you're fasting and you have an experience where pride or anger or bitterness or jealousy or strife or fear, I believe that the Holy Spirit uses our, fa our, our state of fasting, our desire to fast in order to seek the Lord to make us aware of parts of, that we need to repent from and that he then can heal us from. doesn't do us in order to do it in order to make us feel bad, but in order for us to be aware of the things that we need to ask forgiveness for, to be healed from, to be able to bond. Once I realized that in the airport, I prayed about it, felt much better in terms of not feeling as though uh, I were the king of the forest and you guys need to get out of my way. Right? Uh, so. We need to see that it is exactly, fasting can exactly show us the things in our life that are making us less godly, so that we can repent from them, be healed of them, and become more like Christ. Now, a key to this is that fasting always has to be centered on God. It always need to, needs to accompany prayer and study of God's Word and worship. In fact, it's really not a good idea to do it when you're traveling. When you've got all these other distractions in your airports and everything else, okay, it's better to have a time when you know that you can spend time. One one writer I, I read said that when you are fasting, do it with your Bible open all the time. Keep your Bible open on your desk or table or whatever, and keep coming back to it as part of fasting because God will use this process in order to show things to you. Um, 
Fasting that is done in a godly way shows us what drives us, and it brings us back to the things of God. It helps us find balance in our lives. To get rid of the things that are throwing us out of balance spiritually, help us recognize the cravings and the desires we have that are not honoring to God, so that we can seek healing from those things. All right? Um, any questions about that? So one way to think about fasting is an opportunity to lay down an appetite, whether it's an appetite for food or media or shopping, to lay it down before the Lord and ask Him to open us up to the things of God because of it. All right? Um, more quotes. This one from Dallas Willard. Again, fasting confirms our utter dependence on God by finding in Him a source of sustenance beyond food. Through it, we learn by experience that God's word to us is a life substance. Uh, that it is not food, bread, that is, you know, man does not live by bread alone, as we'll see. That it is not food alone that gives life, but also the words that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Willard makes the point, and I had never really thought about this, but I agree with him, now that I thought about it and prayed about it. Two scriptures where Jesus talks about uh, his relationship to food, if you will, and his relationship to the word of God the Father. In Matthew 4, 2-4, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This, past, this part we quoted earlier, that Jesus fasted. The tempter, that is Satan, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. <coughs> Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I always thought that was a metaphor. Okay? And a good one, but a metaphor. Well, Dallas Willard goes on, and then refers to a second verse that relates to this, again with Jesus. Willard says, We learn that we too have meat to eat that the world does not know about. Fasting unto the Lord is therefore feasting, feasting on Him and on doing His will. And the passage in John 4, 31-35 says, Meanwhile His disciples urged Him, Rabbi, have something to eat. But He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then His disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I think I always assumed that the Matthew 4 passage and the John 4 passage where Jesus is talking about the fact that he is fed and that we are fed, you know, man does not live by bread alone, by the word of God and by the will of God, that that was, you know, he was using a metaphor that we're sustained spiritually instead of Willard says, and I think I agree with him, that that's not what Jesus meant. That in a very real way, he was physically as well as spiritually sustained during his focus on the things of God. On God's word and on prayer and on fellowship with God the Father and on doing his will. It's not just a metaphor for being fed spiritually instead of being fed physically with bread, but we really are sustained. We really are maintained. And that's why don't fast like it's a diet. You know, entirely by your will, because it will be miserable and you won't get anything out of it. You have to have a sense in which you are seeking the sustenance of God's word and his will to seek to grow closer to Christ and more like him, to pursue holiness, and in that way you will be sustained. The people who do long fasts these days don't do so by act of will. It's because God, I believe, miraculously sustains them in that. Okay? Um, and you will stop me with questions as we go along. Some of this is kind of heady stuff. It may not be the sorts of things you've thought about before. But I do believe there's scriptural support for it. Uh, again, a quote from Brian Taylor, who wrote a book called Becoming Christ. Self-denial, and, and I like this, self-denial, missing a meal, fasting, denying yourself something that otherwise is good for the sake of growing spiritually. Self-denial is divinely contemplative, for it works by the process of human subtraction and divine addition. If we go into something like fasting or any self-denial, and I'm not talking about self-denial for the sake of mortification. Again, this is not beat yourself up and God will like you more. He won't. In fact, he might smack you around for using the temple of the Holy Spirit. But when we do acts of self-denial, in order to take away something that has that has been a preoccupation for us, even if it's food, if we submit that to God in the process, He then will fill that gap with, with Himself. We subtract something human 
God will add something divine. And that's one of the reasons fasting works. That's what it does for us. And Dallas Willard, again, persons well used to fasting as a systematic practice will have a clear and constant sense of their resources in God. And that will help them endure deprivations of all kinds, even to the point of coping with them easily and cheerfully. Um, we all run into things, problems, we all run into stresses and strains, we all run into kinds of deprivation. How we deal with those things in life may very well be whether or not we have prepared ourselves for deprivation by willingly, consciously, voluntarily choosing to set aside some of our appetites in the process of seeking God and asking Him to fill that in us. Does that make sense to you? Are you good with that? I'm sure that there's one or two people in this room who are having real heartburn about this and think this sounds all new age and weird. It's not. The church has been doing this for 2,000 years and found it to be a way to grow closer to Christ. Now, yes, it, it was abused for a time in the Middle Ages, but from the very early, from the biblical times down to modern times, this has been a discipline that has brought people closer to the Lord. Um, another Dallas Willard quote, in case you can't tell, I like him. Um, actually, I did it with him one time. <coughs> <laughs> but I didn't know I liked him as well until I started reading his books. So, yes. You would discuss fasting. No, we didn't talk about fasting. Actually, we talked about the President of the United States, who, who he knew. So, and I'm not going to tell you what he said. Uh, I, I was at a conference. I was doing consulting with Alpha, you know, the Alpha courses in Dallas. And he was on, had been, I think, on the board or a consultant or an uh, advisor to them or something. And so we, they had dinner for all of us. And he and I had to sit next to each other. So. It's not like he called me and said, Ross, buddy, let's have dinner. You know? um, but his, his work's really good. His book's really good. So, Dallas Willard said, since food has a, the pervasive place, um, it does, it should be does, not dies. Um, since food has a pervasive place, it does not dies. <laughs> okay, that's playing into the whole problem, right? <laughs> uh, since food has the pervasive place it does in our lives, the effect of fasting will be diffused throughout our personality. Fasting, though, is a hard discipline to practice without it consuming all our attention. Yet when we use it as part of, a, of a prayer or service, we cannot allow it to do so, meaning we can't allow it to occupy all of our attention. One of the problems is somebody who fasts and they spend every minute of fasting and, oh man, I'm really hungry. <laughs> You're not going to gain any spiritual benefit from that. That's not the point. So you can't allow it to occupy or consume all your attention. When a person chooses fasting as a spiritual discipline, he or she must then practice it well enough and often enough become, to become experienced in it. Because only the person who is well habituated to systematic fasting as a discipline can use it effectively as a part of direct service to God. Now, again, part of what this is saying is that, uh, let's recognize that one of the reasons fasting is valuable to us, is, is important to us, is that there's very little else that preoccupies us as much as eating. Right? Go in any bookstore and see how many diet books there are, or how many cookbooks. You know, two, two ends of the extreme. How much of the square footage of the main floor of our houses is taken up by the kitchen and the dining room? Okay? And then the bathrooms, which is the other end of that process. <laughs> um, and so, we need to recognize that, that eating food is an all-pervasive thing. It's not bad at all. But that makes it a primary area that we can look at and say, am I preoccupied with this? Am I over, overly concerned with getting my next meal or making sure it's a spectacular meal or getting that third serving or whatever it is? If we recognize that this is a place in our lives that we can voluntarily set aside something that is good. I believe God, God made food taste good because he wanted to bless us with it. You know, Or we'd all just be eating vitamin enriched gruel all day long. And those of you who know me know I cook and that I really like good food. And so I'm, I am not saying that good food is bad, a bad idea. But if we become so preoccupied with it that it becomes a major motivator in our lives, then we have a problem. And then very likely for many of us is the one area that we most need to recognize our preoccupation and pull back from by fasting. But once you start fasting, as, as Willard is saying here, it is not easy. This is not an easy discipline. You know, for whether people do it or not, they can say, well, you know, it's, it, there's very little um, cost to me of doing a Bible study or spending time in prayer. Now, we, we 
do it for five minutes, we think that's enough, and it's not. But when you come to fasting to the point where you feel hunger, then, then we feel like we're, you know, there's a problem. And, and there's not. But we need to do it often enough that our preoccupation isn't an, oh, I'm hungry, I'm so hungry, man, I'm hungry, when's supper, when can I eat? Can I break this thing? I know I said I was going 36 hours, but maybe you'll only accept nine. You know? <laughs> That's the wrong thing. And so we're going to talk about starting slow. Starting slow and easy and who should do that. Now, again, the reason for fasting is, the best reason for fasting is to advance our own pursuit of holiness. To become more like Christ so that we are closer to God. That's the primary reason. But there are other reasons why Scripture talks about fasting and times when fasting is recommended. Particularly, there are a number of places where it talks about fasting at times of repentance and acknowledgement of our own sin and of our, uh, our need to confess to the Lord and receive His forgiveness. Now, fasting does not make up for your sin. It is a way of telling God you're serious about your sin. Too many Christians say, oh, well, I'm saved by the grace of Christ, and yeah, I just ran over that guy on the sidewalk, but praise God, I'm forgiven. You know, they go right on. There is such a thing as feeling grief over your sin, even though you're forgiven for it. And God takes that, I, I believe he wants us to feel a brokenheartedness about our own sin. St. John of the Cross talked about the dark night of the soul, and he was saying this as a Christian, a believer that there were times in which God gave him such a vivid sense of his sinfulness that he experienced the dark night of the soul, but because of that dark night, the light of grace that came through the sacrifice of Jesus was so much brighter. Okay? We have to experience the grief. I, I said in, I think, Bible study, uh, to be able to pray, you know, Lord God, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. Lord God, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. Lord God, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant me thy peace. We need to have awareness of our sinfulness, not because we have to do something to, to be forgiven, but because cheap grace is not what God intends. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote the book, The Cost of Discipleship, and in it, a wonderful book, the theme is that grace is free, but it's not cheap. And don't us cheapen it by thinking that our sin is just a, a whiffle. You know, it's not a big deal. It is. My sin is what caused Jesus to have to hang on the cross. And I, I can never forget that, even though he's forgiven me. All right? Okay. So, repentance is one of the times in which uh, Scripture talks about fasting. In 1 Samuel, then Samuel said, this is the prophet Samuel, Assemble all Israel at mitzvah. And I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had get assembled at Mitzvah, he drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mitzvah. This is before the anointing of uh, King Saul, or uh, yeah, King Saul, the first of the kings of Israel. So a time of repentance and confession is a time for fasting. Continuing on that theme. From Psalm 69, this is a psalm of David. This is King David talking. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, which is a sign of confession, asking forgiveness, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. King David used Fasting as part, fasting and weeping as part of his confession and asking God to forgive and bless. Now David or Samuel did not have the advantage of knowing the grace of Jesus Christ, which is a great advantage. And yet, you know, they, we too can use fasting as part of confession. There's also, throughout scripture, the sense in which fasting is done at a time of mourning. Nehemiah, when he heard about the, the terrible situation in Jerusalem, how the walls were torn down and raiders were coming in, he writes in the first chapter, uh, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You will notice how often fasting and praying is going together here, because those are sort of two halves of the same process. Uh, if you fast without praying, you're just dieting. Okay. Uh, another reason, 
closely related to, to these is to fast at a time of great need in order to seek the Lord's blessing. We have a lot of examples of this in the Old Testament. In the book of Esther, when Mordecai, uh, her cousin, comes to Esther, who was queen over the uh, Syrians, or I'm sorry, the Persians, and says, go before the king and tell him this terrible thing that's going to be done to the Jews. And she says, I can't do that, because if you go in to see the king without being invited, the penalty is death. And he Mordecai said that beautiful thing about, well, if you don't, then God will raise somebody else up to save his people. And it may be for just such a time as this that you were given this position. Well, Esther's response is, she says, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, which was the capital city of the Persian Empire, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She fasted and prayed before the Lord and asked other people to do it as well for three days and neither food nor drink um, in order to prepare, to understand God's will and to prepare herself for something that was going to be very dangerous and ended up being a blessing, the great story of Esther. Another time of great need was when David... Um, through his affair with Bathsheba, and then when he arranged for Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's um, husband, to be killed, she became pregnant, or she became pregnant before he had to kill, and so he married her. When she bore a son, part of God's judgment was that the son would not live. And we have this passage from 2 Samuel 12. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground, after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. So David fasted and wept, and literally, you know, was pros, you know, prone on the ground, prostrate on the ground, prostrate. <laughs> there's an R in there. He's prostrate on the ground, pleading with God for the child to live. Well, there's two lessons in here. One, that fasting to seek God's will in time of great need. But God's will was set. This was part of the punishment for the great sin, not only of adultery, but of murder that David had committed. And this is an example where even if we fast sincerely and pray sincerely, we are not going to force God to do anything. Fasting will not force God's hand to do something that is not in His will. Don't make that mistake. Don't say, okay, I'm not going to eat for three days, and then God has to give me what I want. No, that's not the way it works. And I've always thought it's fascinating that David, he fasted and he wept and he prayed and he, he was prone on the ground until the clear answer, which was not the answer he wanted when the child died. And then he gets up, he cleans himself, puts on lotion, clothing, and he sits down to eat. In other words, he goes back to his life, which is really a sign of faith in that case, that um, God has answered, and now it's my job to move forward. Yes, I like where it says he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped first before right. he went to eat. Very he, true. He probably praised God and yeah. accepted. It's the acceptance of God's will. I think you're right. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk now about how not to fast. And I'm going to come back around to... This is spiritually how not to fast. I'm going to come back around to how it's done in a little while. Um, we have a number of passages about bad fasting, you know, misunderstanding what it was all about. That the idea that it's not just physical, and it does require a commitment to some kind of righteousness before God. We really have to be wanting to do the things of God, not just think, if I do this fasting thing, then God will give me what I want. Uh, one passage from Isaiah 58 why? The Israelites were not getting what they wanted. Why have we fasted, they said, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Have you not noticed, God, how humble I am? I think you should really glorify me because of this. Okay. 
Yet on the day of your fasting, this is the response, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed or for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Instead, to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? What God is saying through the prophet Isaiah to the Israelites is don't think you can just put on a fast for a day and yet break every other aspect of my will, everything else I've told you about myself, you violate all of that, take advantage of people, don't care about people in need, and on and on and on, and you think because you didn't eat for one day that everything's going to be all right? No, this fasting is one piece of a larger commitment that we have to have to spiritual practices, to, to being obedient to the Lord, to being honoring to the Lord, to becoming more like Jesus. If we think that, again, and this was the mistake that was made in the Middle Ages, the asceticism, if I, even if my heart's not in it, even if I'm not sure what I believe, even if I'm not committed to the things of God, if I break my body on the wheel of fasting or mortification, whatever, then God will tell me I'm okay. Isaiah 58 is where God said, no, it wasn't true for the Israelites, it wasn't true for the ascetics in the Middle Ages, it's not true for you. It's a bigger deal than just not eating. But that can be an important part of it if you do have the right orientation. Is that clear? Are we good with that? Another example of what, how not to fast from Zechariah, the seventh chapter. Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous, and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Again, don't think because you fast, even if you do it regularly, that that is sufficient to garner God's blessing. If you are blatantly, obviously, as in the case of Isaiah and Zechariah's testimony here, denying the goodness and grace that God desires for you to be vehicle of to the rest of the world. Okay? We must be intent on serving him as he desires to be served for our fasting to make a difference for us spiritually. All right? And then from Matthew 6, in terms of fasting, Jesus gives instructions. You'll notice again, when you fast, not if you fast, not you have to fast, but when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus is saying, don't do this for show. Don't do this so we go, oh, the cross is so holy. <laughs> Twice a week he looks horrible because he doesn't eat. Um, that's not the point. I've received my reward if I'm getting kudos from everybody for the fact that, that I'm fasting. Now, I want to, and I'm going to give you a passage in a minute. The Pharisees made a point of fasting twice a week. Not because it was required. In fact, in Jewish law, there was only one time of the year that was required to fast, and that was from uh, sunrise to sunset on the Day of Atonement, what we know as Yom Kippur. Um, they were as told to fast then. The Muslims, of course, fast for a month. Uh, the month of Ramadan, they're not allowed to eat from daylight to dark. And the interesting thing is, hospitals are full of people with, with exploded stomachs after dark because they eat so much, 
apparently afterwards that it's a real problem. And again, you think, okay, what's my orientation here? But the Pharisees would boast about fasting twice a week as part of their righteousness. The habit had, had developed with the Pharisees in Jesus' time that they would always fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The reason they fasted on Tuesdays and Thursdays is those were market days when everybody came into town and they could see them fasting because they wanted to be recognized for their holiness. That's not what we're supposed to do. And that's why Jesus is saying this. He's saying, don't do it like the Pharisees. Don't do it like people are prone to do to get credit for. Um, and I, I want to give you a parallel here, an example that's not eating, but that, that my experience. I had a friend who was um, a minister, uh, a woman friend. A bunch of us were having dinner one night. This is a long time ago in Seattle before Carol and I were married. And she started going into great detail about her latest counseling session and how God had, you know, ministered to her in this way and, you know, all the things that were coming out in terms of her brokenness and other. And I was very, very uncomfortable the whole time. And, and later on she said, Ross, you seemed uncomfortable while I was sharing about, you know, for like an hour about my, uh, my counseling and stuff. And I said to her, you know, because her counseling was, was sort of mental health counseling, but it was also spiritual counseling, I said, I was very uncomfortable with it, and it finally occurred to me that I felt like you were doing what Jesus said not to do, and that is making a big scene over your spiritual activity. And I said, I think that we should treat things like counseling, or, or, or you know, if we have a spiritual mentor or guide, or anything else like that, the way Jesus talked about fasting, and that is don't. Don't be telling everybody all the details of it, as though that somehow gives you credit. And I said, I, I'm sorry, but that one, that's what it felt like to me, and I was very uncomfortable. It took me a while to figure out that this is what, what I think was going on. And, and I told her that. I said, I think you're a great person, but I don't think you should do that. Now, we need to be careful that we don't um, go too far the other direction either. Part of the spiritual discipline of fasting, because it's difficult. Right? It's not easy. I think that people that we are close to, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, those that we are close to in the faith, we might ask them to pray for us. So don't try to do this just as a lone ranger. Don't do it so that you can be seen by everybody and you know people can say, oh, how holy that person you, know, you are because you're fasting. But if there are people that you are close to, maybe small group members, maybe spouse, maybe somebody else, Ask them to pray for you. Have their support as an encouragement. Because it's not easy. And pray especially that not only you won't be over, overwhelmed by the difficulty of fasting, but also that you will be over, instead you will be overwhelmed by the blessing that you derive from it. Okay? So don't, go, don't think this means don't, nobody should ever, ever know that you're fasting. I don't, I don't think that's what, what Jesus intended. Okay? Um, now, the passage that I sort of refer to, or the, the situation... Again, how not to pass from Luke 18. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So, this is for you. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <coughs> I tell you that this man, meaning the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you boast of your fasting or your giving or any other discipline, so that for the purpose of other people knowing about it, then that's your reward. And you're not going to get the other things you need. Now, this is what I struggle with. Okay? Now, let me tell you how I struggle with it. Part of my job as pastor of the church is to try to be an example. So where's the line where I try to let people know, you know that I'm taking seriously pursuing these disciplines as an example so that they can... You know, so that they'll know that I take it seriously and maybe be encouraged to try to do so. Especially when it comes to things like giving or whatever. Well, I don't ever quote numbers or that sort of thing. But I would, I would appreciate your prayers. <coughs> you know, where to draw that line, where that balance is. 
from time to time, when I'm asking people to give to the things of the church, to give to the things of the kingdom, I have said, I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid for this. So when you give, it's not going in my pocket. So I can ask boldly for you to give to the church because I don't get anything out of this. Well, some, I do that, and sometimes I feel uncomfortable about it. Like, like it may be perceived that I'm boasting about that, and I don't really feel that way. What I'm trying to do is encourage people, you know, you should give. You should be committed to, the, to giving to the things of God. That's one of the disciplines we'll talk about later on. And so it's not, there are times in which this is difficult, you know, and I appreciate your prayers, and let me know if you have any insights or wisdom about that. All right. Any questions about any of this? That last part in 14 that was said by, who's saying that? Um, <coughs> Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. Yeah, the whole thing. All right. Uh, let me see. Okay, I thought so. I'm going to just leave that up. I want to talk now about, um, well, first we're going to take a break. And then we'll come back and I'm going to talk about how to fast safely, how to get started at it, you know, etc. So the practical part of it. We'll take a break and come back together in 10 after 2. two. Our discussion of the practical side, having looked at the theological and biblical, uh, the spiritual aspects of it. Um, so let's discuss kinds of fasts. The most common kind of fast that, it, that is talked about in scripture um, is a, an absolute fast, meaning neither food nor water. That's what Esther called for for three days, that's what uh, you know, a number of the fasts are. There also is the kind of fast that is no food but water. Right? Um, Jesus, for instance, it says that he had not eaten for 40 days and he was hungry. There's no indication of him being thirsty. So, and that's the, that's the more typical one. There are also in Scripture are supernatural facts, like Moses going 40 days and then 40 more days uh, is, uh, is a supernatural fast. The fact is, a lot of people think, if I don't eat for three days, I'll die. <laughs> In fact, for most of us, if you don't eat for three days, you're not even starting to burn up fat supplies. <laughs> it, uh, most people could live for weeks um, without food. At a certain point, your body does start consuming muscle tissue. You know, it starts damaging your body. So you don't want to go that far. But for most of us to, to be able to fast that is no food, it's not a problem. You do need to have water. You can't go much more than three days or so without water. And so that's why I don't recommend, I don't think, unless God has especially, you know, called you to this, that an absolute fast with no food or water is necessary. There also are intermediate kind of fasts where you may do like a juice fast, where you are taking fruit juices or vegetable juices. Um, particularly if you have a juicer. Have you guys seen um, Fat Sick and Almost Dead? There's a video that an Australian guy who came to the U.S. did. It's really good. Yeah. He was way overweight, you know, there's a scene where he's walking along by a swimming pool, he does, he's got just trunks on, doesn't have shirt on, he's got a stomach, goes, look at that beauty, looks like a swallowed a sheep. <laughs> well, he also suffered from an, an immune disease, uh, looks like a swallowed a sheep, is what it said. Oh, I said, swallowed a sheep. Swallowed a sheep, yeah. Oh. Um, sorry. <laughs> My Australian accent's a little too authentic. <laughs> anyway. He, you know, he did a juice fast for 40 days, I think it was 40 days, and ended up, um, you know, losing weight, getting rid of the immune deficiency disease that he suffered from, um, all sorts of things. And so, there are a lot of medical authorities who are suggesting now the idea of juice fast for health reasons. We're talking about spiritual reasons, but you know what, if you can get healthier and improve the, the state of the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body, then that's all the better. That's a nice side benefit. That's not the primary reason we're talking about fasting. But there's advantage to that. So you may want to think in terms of, especially as you get started, doing a juice fast. In fact, Daniel, Daniel and the, the other um, sort of young Israelite noblemen who were taken into Babylon during the exile, they asked to be uh, taken off the regular diet, which included wine and meats and all kinds of stuff, and that they would have water and vegetables. And they were found to be healthier and were allowed to continue that. There's another place in Daniel where he talks about the fact that he went through a, a period of fast in which he drank no wine, ate no delicacies, and no meat. So there are other kinds of fasts where you just deny aspects of it. But the main thing is, if you were, is that you do it as a spiritual discipline. We'll talk about that in a minute, how to prepare spiritually for this sort of thing. Now, I want to have a, a very strong disclaimer in here, and that is that 
you need to make sure that you are uh, you don't have any health problems before you enter into a fast. If you do have any health problems, make absolutely sure that you check with your physician that it's not going to be a problem, and they may qualify. They may be the ones the physician say, well. It's okay with me if you don't eat, you know, solid food, but you need to at least get fruit juices and stuff and don't go longer than 36 hours or something. You may get some qualifiers. But let me give you kind of a background. The following people without um, medical supervision should not plan on fasting. Okay. People who are physically too thin or emaciated, so Norm, you're, you're good. <laughs> people, people who are prone to anorexia or bulimia or other behavioral disorders that have to do with food. Okay, there are other issues there. Anyone who suffers from anemia or general weakness, because you know your blood sugar and other things are obviously affected by this. People who have uh, bleeding ulcers or cancer, blood diseases, heart disease, tumors. People who suffer from chronic problems with their kidneys, liver, lungs, heart, or other important organs. People who are diabetic on insulin, even if you're just on oral meds, as I am, you need to be cautious about this. Keep pay attention. Or if you have other uh, blood sugar problems like uh, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, either one, because this, you know, not eating can throw all that off. Or women who are pregnant or nursing. Okay. So, um, you're all thinking, you know, got off. <laughs> well, most of us probably don't have those things. But if you do, take that very seriously. I don't, don't pursue a fast or talk to your doctor. That's simply being wise. God does not want us to hurt ourselves. So we need we need to be cautious about that. Any questions about that? Okay. So go into this with your eyes open and with with your you know your wisdom hat screwed on. Yes. Well, if some people kind of do that, the, the kind of fasting you know from food or whatever, they can fast in other ways. Exactly. Like fast from talking too much or fast. Right. Right. Okay. You know, exactly. If you to to uh, we're going to talk about silence. You can fast from talking. You can have a retreat for a day and not talk. Don't, don't get on the telephone. You can fast from Facebook. From technology. From technology. Um, yeah, there are other ways in which you can do this where you are setting aside, again, remember the definition, to, to set aside and not partake in something that otherwise is fine, is good for you even, um, for the sake of growing spiritually. So if, if you have physical health problems that prevent you from doing this with food, then you can do it with other things. Yes, Kina. Well, I think oftentimes, you know, we think we can't go without food, but there are foods. I mean, you have sugar, caffeine, oils, fats, fried foods, things that aren't really helping you if you right. have a medical condition anyway. Right. Uh, I think oftentimes we, we say, oh, we can't do that, but there are things. I mean, you know, my body doesn't need chocolate, although I enjoy it, you know. Actually, they said that it's beneficial. <laughs> like coffee. I mean, they're, they're on the right. food chart. But you're absolutely right. And in fact, that's the sort of fast we're talking about with Daniel, where you say there's certain foods that I'm not going to take off. And maybe it's a favorite food. You know, not one that's necessary for your sustenance, but, but chocolate, okay, or something where it's a discipline that you can pursue. Uh, and one of the other things I should talk about, too, is that if you do a fast that, that causes you to have hunger pangs, one of the ways to deal with that uh, is whenever you feel those, let that be sort of an alarm clock that causes you to think of the things of God. Mm. You feel the hunger, and you say, Lord, I'm doing this because I want to be closer to you. Bless me. Open me to your presence and your reality. And so the very fact that you're having a physical reaction to it, you know, I'm not talking about fainting and passing out or anything, but the fact that you can feel the, the, the fact you haven't been eating, that can be the very thing that, it, that reminds you and points you the things of God. And in that way, that can be an advantage. Feeling hunger, feeling those pangs can be something that keeps you focused and keeps you directed. Okay? Not that you, and, and that also is one of the ways that you keep from being obsessed, as we said earlier, you know, preoccupied with the physical part of it. Use that to focus you spiritually. Uh, and that can be a positive thing. All right, now, how to prepare yourself for this? Um, as you're preparing to go into a time of fasting, whether it be food or something else. The most critical thing, I believe, is that you examine your heart. That you think about, okay, why do I want to do this? What is my motivation in wanting to do this? What do I hope to accomplish in it? And the answer to that should be that I want to grow closer to God. 
I want to be more aware of God's very real presence in my life. That's why it's a spiritual discipline. Now, as part of that process of examining your own heart, you need to ask yourself up front, and this may, other things may come up as you go through the, the process of fasting, but you need to ask yourself up front, do I have any sin in my life that is unconfessed or that I've been unwilling to confront? Because one of the things that will cause fasting as a spiritual exercise to not work for you is if you have unrepented or unconfessed sin. If you have a point of stopping by every Friday at the, the pirate video place in front of uh, Super Lake and you know that's wrong, and it is wrong, <laughs> then you need to deal with that. You know, if you... Uh, are harboring anger and bitterness towards somebody, and you know that you shouldn't be feeling that way. And every time you start feeling that way, you say, yeah, but they deserve it. Well, maybe they do, but that doesn't make it okay for you to continue to pursue that. All right? If you've got something in your life that you know is an unconfessed or unrepented sin, then you need to deal with that, or you're not going to receive the benefit from, from the spiritual uh, the spiritual fast that we're talking about. Okay? Um, so, that sort of uh, is, is a start. Let me get into that a little bit more here. I've got some other, some other notes. I said that you need to look at your own heart and say, why are you doing this? And I think it's even helpful, particularly if, if you're journaling. Um, and there are a couple of these things like journaling today. I was going to talk about some of those things. Some of these I'm going to pick up later. We're going to talk about them in the class. But as I prepared the lesson, there wasn't a lot of room for, for some of those uh, other ones. So, but if you journal, then... Pray about and think about, look in your heart as to why you want to pursue a fast, and then write it down. Write it in your journal. State your clear reason. And the right reason is that it should be for spiritual guidance. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, I also could benefit from, from the health advantages of this, you know, if you, if you do it a certain way, but because that in itself would be honoring to God, that I would have more energy, that my body would be healthier, that I would be a better vessel to serve Him. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that has to be very much secondary. The primary reason needs to be spiritual. That's why you're really doing it. Um, you, some other reasons that are part of the spiritual part is that it may enable you to pray more specifically or strategically. It may be that you have a specific thing, that you, wanna, you want to fast and pray for revival in our community. There's a good one. <laughs> that you want to fast and pray for blessing for the growth um, and ministry of your church. It's this church or some other one. I, you know, I'm I'm very happy if you want to pray for and fast for the spiritual you know benefit of this church. But whatever church you're a part of, those are additional things. Now, as I said earlier, those are all useful and beneficial and valuable and, and God honoring ways to pursue spiritual fast. The primary reason always is for you to pursue holiness, for you to grow closer to the Lord, because that's the most honoring thing. And sometimes if you start with that, if you pursue that first, then God will bless that desire and that effort through fasting and prayer and a, and a discipline that you practice over time so that you then have a firmer foundation, if you will, from which you can begin to pray for renewal and revival and things of that sort. So make sure that, that you're looking out for your own spiritual, because that's God's primary desire for you, is that you be his child and, and close to him. Okay? Now, um, Questions about that? The spiritual per, uh, preparation for it? Uh, then you need to be concerned about the physical preparation as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into this here. I just told you who shouldn't try to fast, at least not unless you have medical approval and oversight to, to go into it. But while we're talking about fasting as a spiritual discipline, it occurs on a physical plane. You know, to, to um, commit our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so there is a physical aspect to it, and we need to be aware of that not only in, in the event that we have some physical problem that might prevent it, but also because there's a physical side of it as we go into it. One of the things that I would recommend is that before you start fasting, I'm going to talk about timing and everything in a minute, um, that you, you think about eating smaller meals as you lead up to it, particularly that you stay away from heavy meals and grease and that kind of stuff, but that you eat vegetables and fruit while not leading up. The idea that you're going to have one last big fling before you go on a fast is a really bad idea because it throws your system off. Mm -hmm. So cut back on your meals a little bit for a few days before in order to kind of prepare your body, the physical side of it. Um, and then when you start fasting, start slowly. Don't 
you know, don't start back to back 40 day fast like Moses did. Um, the, the thing I would recommend to you is that when you first start fasting, that you do so for a short period of time. A, a smart way to do it might be to fast from noon to noon, which means you have lunch on a given day, you don't eat supper, you go to bed, which means that a big chunk of the time as you're starting out especially, you're asleep and so you're not as aware of it, and then you don't have breakfast the next morning, or maybe you have juice, uh, and then you break your fast at noon the next day. So you're going noon to noon. You're missing supper, the evening meal, and you're missing the morning meal. That's a good way to start. You might then uh, come to the place from that, when you're comfortable with that, and you're feeling the spiritual benefits, and physically you're okay with that, you might then start thinking about uh, a full 24-hour fast, where, for instance, you might have breakfast and then you don't fast again until, you know, through the whole day. Yes? How long do you recommend doing the, from like noon to noon first before going to the 24-hour time? Yeah, I would recommend that you do that. Uh, there's no rules. You know, there's no, you have to do it this way. For some people, you might do noon to noon and go, well, I'm feeling some spiritual benefit and physically there was no, I didn't feel anything. You know, there was no downside. Then you could move fairly quickly to a full 24-hour fast and even a 48-hour fast. To me, um, I, I, I agree with John Wesley. John Wesley always fasted two days a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. And in fact, although there is no biblical mandate, just as a matter of policy, when you ordain ministers, he wouldn't ordain somebody as a minister unless they fasted two days a week. Now, whether you do that, skip an evening meal, and then go through and skip, you know, and then don't eat again until the following evening meal, which is 24 hours, or however you do that, I think the idea of fasting one day a week, or perhaps two days a week, is a very good one. I think that that's the foundation of a good spiritual discipline for fasting. But start out easy, you know, like skip, you know, skip dinner and then maybe breakfast, or maybe you skip to start. You maybe skip dinner and then you have fruit juice or something next morning for breakfast, and then eat lunch, a light lunch. That's the other thing. Is I say eat light before you start. Well, eat light when you start back too. Don't you know? Don't get to you, you've done a 24-hour or 36-hour fast and then you eat a you know a large um, thick pizza, you know. Yeah, Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving dinner, yeah. You know. um, but, you, but you come back into it lighter as well, and that's, that's, that's even more true if you go into longer fast. I think that for you, part of what you need to be doing as you do this is to say, to be preparing yourself spiritually and say to the Lord, what, you know, what will you teach me in this, Lord? And Show me what you desire from me in this process. There are no rules in Scripture. There's no rules that anybody can rightfully give you that say, you have to do this. You need to be sensitive to what God is saying. And God may be saying to you, I want you to fast two days a week. Right? You'll learn that as you get into the process. And is, because part of the process of growing spiritually is that you hear more clearly God's will for you. His desire for you. And that ought to be one of the things that you're seeking through this, through this process. Okay? Um, Ross? Yes? Before you fast, do you set a time on how long you're going to fast? Yeah, I think you do. I mean, it's possible that, that the Lord may instruct somebody, I want you to fast and I'll tell you when to stop. But in most cases, no. I think you need to, and part of it is most of us, we have family members, we have obligations, um, we, need to be, we need to also be sensitive to that, that somebody else isn't getting jerked around because of our lack of scheduling on this. And I think it's fine. It's, it's, there's nothing dishonoring about it if you say, I'm going to skip an evening meal and skip breakfast and eat lunch tomorrow. Um, and set up a schedule like that where you're doing it. Part of the reason why I think you need to do that is because that, remember, the focus on this is not, is not the eating so much as it is the spiritual benefit of the act of self-denial and what the, God will, basically God honors that. God honors it when we say, I'm not the most important thing. You are, Lord, and I want to make a little room here for you to be more present in my life. Going to set aside food for a period of time. Well, when we when we do that and start experiencing that, then again, I believe God will honor that and He will give us a sense. But the focus is spiritual, and so make, the, the ideal is that you set aside a time where you've got room to spend time in prayer and spend time in Bible study. And that's why I say when you're traveling, it's probably not the best time to do it because you're running to catch a plane and you've got meetings and you've got all this. It's kind of hard to focus on the spiritual aspect of it. Instead of just the, the hungry aspects of it. 
So ideally, set aside a time when you can spend time in prayer. You can spend, sit, have your Bible open, have it open on your desk or on your table, and uh, keep coming back to it, and have that part of part of the discipline. Uh, probably not a good idea to, to go in on a food fast and then decide you're going to do a you know a, a nine hour die hard movie marathon. You know, there's just a disconnect there. Okay, you need to have some sense in which this is going to be a spiritual event, not just a physical one. All right. Not that I have anything against die hard. There's a new one coming out in February. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm a guy. Um, questions about eating. I do believe it's true that the more we spend time with God in fellowship, in worship, in adoration through the fasting process, the more we spend in, while we're fasting, reading and meditating on His Word, the more we will sense His presence, and the more we will have a clear sense of His, His desire for us, His will for us, including how we pursue this or other spiritual disciplines. Um, the, the unanimous testimony of people who have practiced fasting as a spiritual discipline for the last 2,000 years, those who have done it right, um, and, and I think that's most people, most of the ones who have done it, um, have been that this is one of the most powerful ways in which you can grow closer to the Lord, that He can become more real in your life, and that's what we're talking about. Carolyn? I have a question about the, the group fast idea. Okay. Like, like um, Esther asked for all the Jews and Susan to right. fast with her. W what do you think about calling a group to do this because it, it, it seems like somebody's going to feel pressured yeah. and we don't do that around here. Right. You know? Exactly. There will be people who, who get weirded out by it because they haven't been in here and talked about it. Look at what scripture says about it. And again, this is not something that most people in our Western culture are comfortable with. Um, I think it's brilliant. In fact, one of the things that as I, over the last week, have been thinking about praying about preparing for this class is as we as a church talk about a new building, uh, it's a huge decision. It's a huge commitment. Not just in terms of getting enough money together to buy the building, but renovation and maintenance and everything else that goes with it. It's huge. Um, and, and yet it's important. Okay, It's critically important because that becomes a tool, a, a, a very significant tool, for us to be more effective in outreach and in ministry and in worship and everything else. And I, that's one of the things I'd consider is to invite people to, to fast. And yeah. pray about what God's will is, and that if it be God's will, then we see the funding that's necessary come. You know, we're close. I, mean, I don't think I'm not worried about that, but that that we see evidence and demonstration of God's will in that. And I think to pray and, and fast over this would be a good idea. Becky, we did it. Okay, <laughs> we're in. <laughs> we're in. Um, the effect on our lives and the effect on the community. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is. It is to me. It's a, as much as anything else. It's an issue of praying for renewal, renewal in our body, revival, and renewal in, in the community. So, are you guys up for that? Those are yes. part of our church. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, let me think about that. Maybe talk talk about it with the session. Yeah. Uh, just one comment to make it a little easier as far as beginning this process. Uh, the Baptist Church, for example, did one of the fasts that you suggested from lunch to lunch. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that might be a good way to work in the. Right. Well, and yeah, it, it, there are organizations, you all are familiar with World Vision, big international relief development. I worked for them for five years. World Vision has a, a program where they get high school students involved in a famine. It's, it's, yeah, it used to be 40 hour famine, then they cut it to a 30 hour famine, which tells us something about our culture. And what they do is they get, you know, like in a weekend or whatever, they get the kids together at the church and they have studies about the needs around the world and how we should respond as Christians, and they don't eat or they have just juices and stuff, and they'll go for 30 hours. And the kids will get sponsors. They will get people to sponsor them during the famine, and that's how they raise money to then contribute to feeding children around the world, right? Uh, great, and the, the reaction that, that, and I know because I worked with them, and Carolyn actually worked on 30 Hour Famine for an agency that she was with, um, the reaction that you get from these kids is that, oh, I didn't think I could do this, or wow, the first couple hours was really horrible, you know, after I started. But, uh, but then they say, but then I began to really understand it, and I began to, you know, and you can see, even if there's not an intent, um, sort of a serious or intense spiritual kind of aspect starting out behind these students, some of them have a real spiritual experience because of that. Because it's honoring to God. It's done in a Christian context, uh, very much so. So, um, yeah, and I think there are other things. We Maybe we as a body need to start thinking seriously about uh, fasting and 
prayer for specific kinds of issues, for renewal and revival, for you know uh, the people who have not heard of the grace and love of Jesus in our community and need to, and are not inclined to otherwise. God can do miraculous things. Part of it is he wants us. He wants to make sure that we're serious. And fasting is one of the ways that we show that we're serious. Okay. Um, talk a little bit more. During your fasting time, to maximize your kind of spiritual experience, as I say, keep your Bible open, keep coming back to it. Make sure that you're using this as a prayer, time of prayer and fasting, which means it's best to do this when you actually have the time to set aside for that. You might even, um, you might want to set on your calendar for the day that you do this, uh, certain times, like every two hours, that you have a very intentional kind of time of prayer for for God's presence in your life, or for if, if you're uh, doing a time of fasting and prayer for a particular need, that you're coming back to that. Which means, unless you really have done this a lot, I don't expect any of you to spend 36 hours in prayer you know, without a break while you're fasting. And so the sensible thing is, as you begin to grow in this discipline, that you set a time for fasting, and you set points within that where you're going you're gonna to really sit down and say, I'm going to really absorb God's word and I'm going to spend time you know, praying about this and I'm going to do that for 15 minutes every two hours or something so that you're, again, being sensible and not expecting that you're going to run a marathon without ever having trained. That's what that would be like to say, I'm going to, I'm going to fast and pray for, you know, for 48 hours or 72 hours constantly. Well, unless you're, unless you're really spiritually developed, then that's probably not going to work for you. Okay? You need to be cautious about those expectations. Um, it is true, too. I believe that the, as we pray, and this is always true, to pray that we can be more like Christ, to pray for God's presence in our life, to pray that we will grow uh, in holiness, because that is honoring to God. It's not just as a blessing to us. It's what God desires. It's honoring to Him. That needs to be our focus. Make sure that we don't fall into saying, um, I want to be better, God, so, you know, in other words, the me is in there all the time. We do this because it's honoring to God. It is what God desires. And that always needs to be our focus, that we are reverencing, we're showing reverence for God, we are praising Him, we are desiring what He desires. We are focusing on God, not just focusing on ourselves. And some of the, some of the keys to that will be whenever you find yourself thinking about yourself, particularly if you feel you're, you're fasting and you feel a hunger pang, let that be a little alarm that sends your thoughts and your prayers to God. And I found that to be effective, because that, that has been how I've experienced that. Um, I'm pretty close to done with the comments I wanted to make today. So why don't we, between now and the next 20 minutes, why don't we all fast? <laughs> it's a joke. Um, questions about that? I don't need to keep talking. Judy? How do you, if you're fasting, I mean, the, the, someone, if I was talking to somebody in this group, they'd understand. But right. somebody else, to call and, oh yeah, well, let's go, or you're invited over for dinner, right. or blah, blah, blah. And you're well, not supposed to say you're fasting, and yeah. you're not supposed to... There's, there's two examples. Uh, for instance, if family members or very close friends who don't get it, if they hear you're fasting, or you know, you're talking to them, and you say, well, you know, I'm fasting today, and they go, oh my gosh, you're going to kill yourself! You know, no, I'm not. You know, every study says unless you have a particular medical problem that it could exas exacerbate, that fasting is actually good for you. Please, now, I will tell you that if you've not fasted before and you do it the first time, you may have a headache for the first, you know, 18 or 24 hours because toxins in your system. If you've ever fasted, it's it's like a it's like if you drink coffee and you don't. You know that feeling? You feel like you've got a mild case of the flu and a headache and all thing? Well, the same thing will happen with food because your body builds up toxins. And particularly if you don't eat well, then you may feel that. Okay? You, you just have to, that's one of the things you just have to sort of power through. Make that an object to your prayer. Is, you know, Lord, sustain me in that. Well, maybe you need to start eating better. Okay? That's, that's one of the other benefits of this is you become aware of it. <coughs> but the, um, oh, back, to, back to what you said. If somebody says to you, oh, you know, let's go to lunch or let's go to dinner, the simplest thing to do without making a big issue is go, oh, no, I've got other plans for lunch. Or I've got other plans for dinner. But you do. You're not going to eat. Those are your plans. Okay. That's the simplest way to address that. 
If a family member or a friend says, oh, you're going to die, no, I'm not. No, I'm not going to die. <coughs> Look at me. I could go a few days and not have any problems at all. Don't worry about that. Uh, that's true for most of us. Um, but, yeah, I think that we simply, we don't want to lie about it. We don't want to, but we also don't want people to be free. We don't want to have people feeling like we're boasting about our spirituality or anything like that. So the simplest thing is to say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, how about on Friday? But I have plans for, for dinner tonight. If you get headaches, which I do frequently if I don't eat when I'm supposed to, uh, what do you do? Stop the fast or, or just uh, turn to the Lord and tell Him to help you with your headache? Well, there's several things. One, frequently a headache like that uh, will be helped if you drink more water. Okay, that's often true because our body, the water helps clean away toxins. So I would recommend that one of the things is you, in fact, I should have said this earlier, but as you prepare for a fast, as you get into a fast, that's why I said I don't recommend an absolute fast where you don't drink water either. I think you should drink a lot of water. In fact, some, some people say that on a fast you should drink um, half, your half, half your body weight in ounces, which in my case is like but yeah, I mean, you know, if you weigh if you weigh 110 pounds and plan on drinking 55 ounces of water in the course of a day, because again, the water is, is good. It flushes you out. It, it helps the toxins, and I think that it also helps with headache. Okay, uh, and so that's one recommendation. If you really, if it's a serious problem, you really have difficulty with it, then I would recommend fruit juices uh, or vegetable juice, because fruit juice, for instance, will give you a little bit of sugar, but a, you know, but not not a sugary drink sugar. It will give you fructose. And that may be one of the things that your body is struggling with is the fact that you, you know, your uh, your body's still going to clean out the toxins. And I think if you do this with any regularity, if you come back and do this, then you'll have less and less problems. With that. Vegetables or vegetable juices? Vegetable juices. Juices. Yeah. Either yeah. either fruit juices or vegetable juices. And if you if you for vegetable juice, you can get a juicer. All right. I got a very good one at Walmart here for like thirty nine dollars. It wasn't. I mean, you can get a Revel. You know, for $299, but you can get a pretty good juicer these days, fairly cheap, which will allow you to juice um, vegetables, you know, chard and things like that, uh, kale, in addition to, um, or you can just, you could blend them, but then you're just eating the whole thing. Yes, Becky. I've noticed that at scale resale seems to hang on to these juicers and stuff. I bought mine from Scale resale, but that little shop for like... Oh, okay. Okay, upscale retail, the consignment store? Yeah. Okay. Well, you might check Barber's too. I mean, you know, they've got Barber's Bazaar might carry it because they got all kinds of, you know, kitchen appliances and sewing machines and whatever. So, yes. Uh, I want to ask Carolyn, when might this be expected to be up, uh, available to view online? The video? Yes. Um, 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 probably tomorrow. Put her on the spot. When? Tomorrow afternoon. Oh, that's she, much earlier than I would have expected, but fine. Yeah, yeah, she, she, yeah she, she's got a couple of other day. projects that she has well, to do. So could we say by, kind of process. I mean, I'd, I'd be comfortable by saying Tuesday? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It does take about 24 hours to process these videos, you know, because mm -hmm. they have to be converted mm -hmm. and then uploaded, and, you know, it's, it's not just like take a moment and put them on there. Uh, Pat? Medication. Well, um, again, people who are on medication, because that implies a physical... Uh, vitamins? Or... Well, I, I don't think vitamins, anything of that sort. Now, if you're, if you're taking anything that's going to affect your blood sugar or affect other systems, then that's probably not a good idea without checking with your doctor first. Uh, in fact, if you have any questions about, is it okay for me to do this, you probably need to talk to your doctor. Okay. Um, I, I take supplements and vitamins, all the, a lot of them, all the time. You know, like 50 tablets a day of different kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. I continue to do that. It's probably like eating, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you take them while you're fasting. Yeah, That's I do. what I'm asking. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 They could come and have other people. That's a very good pray, idea. Pray for them. Yep. But I wanted to tell you, my husband had a brain tumor due to his huge cell phone. He was uh, mm -hmm. one of those great big ones, you know. Right. And I tell people to get 
not use their cell phone so often. They can't give it up. So how could they fast if they can't give up a date? So and that's exactly <laughs> if we find if we find that's true for ourselves, then we need to deal with that because that's that really does become a spiritual issue. Uh, when we talk about fasting, if you can't go with it, without TV, I mean, Carol and I, we have programs we like, and we watch TV in the evenings, but I honestly don't feel like there's anything that if I didn't watch it, I was going to get nervous. Right? <laughs> but there are some people, if they don't have sound on all the time, then it's a problem. We have a dear, dear friend of ours. If she is at home, she often will have the television and the radio on while she's on the computer. And she, she, and she says, if I'm in the car and I don't have radio on, I get nervous. If there is anything, be it TV or radio or cell phone use or shopping or eating or anything else, that if you don't do it for any minimal period of time, you start feeling nervous about it, mm. ding, 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 that's a sign. That's something you need to deal with. Um, when we talk about silence, people who cannot endure silence this because of a spiritual problem our inability to be quiet and there's some people who cannot not talk you know those people <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I read a book um, it was Michael oh the guy who was the doctor and the novelist um, Crichton? Crichton. 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 Michael Crichton he wrote a book called Travels and one of the things he said, he went to Africa, and in, in Africa he went to this, he was, um, went to an, a watering hole at night, and there was a blind. And so you go there, and they've got like, you know, not, not white lights, but other lights so you can see all the animals up pretty close coming up the watering hole. He said he was there with the guy who was kind of the guy, and this family comes in, and they start talking. And the guy says, no, you have to be completely quiet. You can't talk. And they were quiet for just a few minutes, and then one of them said something to the other one. The dad said, no, you can't talk. You have to be quiet, and they won't come. A few minutes later. And he said, it was like that every, after every three or four or five minutes, one of them had to say something, and the other one had to respond. And Michael Crichton made the observation. It's the first time I ever really thought about that. There are some people who are psychologically, and I believe spiritually, incapable of being quiet because there's a fundamental insecurity then if there's not some noise going on, then I better make some. Okay? It's like, it's like our dogs. If you have a dog and, and it's not clear that you're in charge, then he's going to try to be in charge because the nature of wars a vacuum. Okay? But it's true. We need to be comfortable with not having noise or cell phones or TV or, or, or food. Or firecrackers. Or firecrackers. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, you know, what, what, who's, who's in charge? And sometimes I think that, that our need for sound, or some, something to occupy the silence, we're too insecure to allow that to stand, and so something has to be there. Barbara? I would think that fasting and prayer and retreat would be... Right. Really wonderful synergy. I, absolutely. In fact, that's it's. There are retreat centers that you can go to. Uh, in fact, Steve Woodworth, my friend, who's the president of uh, Masterworks, where I just was, he and his wife. Um, I don't know if they're still doing this. They, they lost a son in a car accident uh, a little over a year ago, and so their whole world's been kind of turned upside down in terms of the process. But for years, they would go for a weekend retreat at a, a monastery. And he would be in one wing and she'd be in the other, and it was a weekend of silence. No radio, no TV, no talking. Um, and he's, you know, a time of studying scripture and a time they would do part of it. The time is fasting, I think, if I remember right. Um, and he said that one weekend a year, it's like that recharged our spiritual batteries in a way we never would have dreamed possible until we started doing it. So they did it every year. That kind of thing, I think, would be very powerful. I mean, I've done retreats before, but not sort of silence and fasting kinds of treats, so I think that'd be good. Yes? Well, uh, I have a, a granddaughter, and she has also <coughs> friends since they were 10 years old, you know? And they, they get together every week or every two weeks in a very nice restaurant and in a very nice place, and they used to talk a lot and have conversations. And now, Eleni told me, you know, everybody has a Twitter or their uh, whatever, yeah. and nobody even talks to each other. Yeah. I think that's a more 
her from the devil mm -hmm. because there is no communication. Yeah. She says, she says, you know, I don't feel like even going because even when we're eating, we're looking at something. Yeah. And my daughter on Sundays, her three children go with their boyfriend and girlfriends, you know, and they start doing the same thing. And so now she has a box. And uh, they, they, as they come, they say, leave your room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the meetings where they did so that, so everybody dropped their, dropped their yeah. things yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it was sort of a joke, but we had uh, three friends visiting us you know, last year or sometime. And uh, I walked in the dining room one afternoon, and all three of them were sitting there with their computers in front of them. And I went, oh, the joy of fellowship between brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have to be careful. We don't do that. <laughs> shut ourselves up. Any other question or comment? Simplicity. What? Simplicity. Simplicity. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do simplicity today because I realized that I was doing this and wasn't enough time to really do it. Well, I'll get to it before the class is over. Okay. okay. Uh, I just it'll be one, simple. I just have one more thing to share. My niece went on a 40 hour fast and she said every day got easier. Yeah, it's true. Okay. And, and that, I think that's a universal testimony is the hardest time is the first day. And it's not because we need food, it's because our stomach is used to getting food and it starts saying, hey, something's done, it's different. Yeah. And after, you know, after a little time, it, it, the demand, you know, the, our stomach sort of calms down and doesn't make that demand on us anymore. Several years ago, Andrew and I used to go on fasts about uh, once a month for a week. And what we would do is boil potatoes and vegetables and drink the juice. Okay, that's that was yeah. very good. Good, okay. I encourage you to practice this, to pray about it, to consider, as we said, the process of what are, why would you fast, what are you looking for, um, to enter into it very seriously, and make sure that you're healthy, that there's not any, any problem with that, but that you uh, experiment with it, if you will, spiritually. I think God has promised that he will bless us as we seek him. If you seek me, you will find me. You know, ask, knock, the door will be open to you. Well, this is a way of us coming to the Lord and asking and knocking and asking, please, Lord, make your presence more known to me, and I am committing myself to it in a disciplined way. And God honors that. So I would encourage you to do so. If you have not read the, the Whitney's material on it and Richard Foster's on it, then I recommend you do so. I also would recommend that Dallas Willard book. Several of his books are really good, but the, the Spirit of the Disciplines is the name of the one he wrote about this in the 90s. So, good. God bless you all. Thanks. And uh, I'll deal with simplicity later. Thank you.